Welcome everybody to uh, week nine of Design at Large. Uh, and this week our uh, speaker is Ethan Jackson from Microsoft Research. Uh, he, uh, he came there from Vanderbilt in 2007. Uh, right. And uh, he, uh, um, uh, his background is in formal methods for cyber physical systems, uh, which uh, got him dragged into the most amazing project I, I have ever encountered. <laughs> And for those of you who are afraid of formal methods, I have been promised that <laughs> very, uh, only a very small part of the talk, uh, and he's going he's to give us a very broad spectrum view of uh, uh, project premonition. Cool. Thank you. Um, yeah, so, so maybe I'll just tell you the history before I jump in, because it's a, a big, crazy story. But um, 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 yeah, so, so my background is in formal methods uh, for cyber physical systems, and I think you know, there's been a lot of interesting advances in this space to, to, um, to scale the ability to validate and verify software. So at some point, we started to ask the question, if we can really do it, how do we apply it? What, what, you know, what is the right use for autonomous systems in society, in the world, if we can really get them right? Um, and we did a lot of thinking about that, came up with some crazy ideas. This is one of them. <laughs> and this is the one we started to dig into uh, for about the last year and a half now. Um, uh, so let me just let me just go into the story and please stop me whenever you want because I'm going to touch on a bunch of different technologies, a bunch of different pieces, and ask me any crazy question. Okay, so here we go. Um, so Project Premonition is about uh, emerging infectious diseases and technologies to stop them. Um, so I think this is a, is, is a really informative chart. So uh, emerging infectious diseases are diseases whose prevalence has increased unexpectedly in the last 20 years. Um, like most infectious diseases, you know, they pose a threat to, to humans, to economies, to societies. But unlike most, they're very unpredictable. And that unpredictability has pretty enormous costs. Um, we started this project in uh, late 2014, and this number really I, I thought was incredible, that, that Ebola, one of the rarest viruses on the planet, had a direct cost to the U.S. and $2.8 billion in congressional funding for four imported cases of Ebola. You can look back in history, you can see that these kind of emerging diseases that jump out and surprise us, they, ha they happen fairly often. Um, you know, if you look at avian flu, the cost here is the cost to cull chickens across the planet so that we don't, you know, we try to prevent as much as possible the ability of it to jump into humans. Um, we don't have a good sense on what that probability is. You see SARS in China, totally novel, right, uh, coronavirus. After Ebola, you have MERS, and most rec recently you have Zika, which we knew about in Africa, but we didn't know that it would be at our doorstep. Um, so, so we started to think about, you know, I I is this a good place for autonomous systems to give us more data about what's going on in the environment so that you can really predict and respond to these kind of events, you know, before they catch you um, by surprise. Uh, looking into the problem, it's actually really tough, um, which is probably why there isn't a good way to do it today. Um, the reason it's tough is for a few reasons. Um, one is that the majority of these emerging infectious diseases are what biologists call zoonotic. They are maintained in animals, they evolve in animals, and they jump from animals to people in a way that we don't understand. So predicting it at some level is predicting the evolution in an animal population that you don't even monitor. Um, like I said, 60% is the lower bound, upper bound is the estimate of 75%. Uh, Ebola is a zoonotic disease. Um, uh, if you look at uh, the best methods for predicting outbreaks today, these are run by organizations like the WHO. They basically aggregate data. They aggregate data coming from hospitals, from news media, and they try to make a prediction that something interesting is going on. Um, these have a delay of about two weeks um, from the time an outbreak in humans has occurred. Two weeks is too long to stop most spread of diseases under, under many epidemiological models. So, you know, flu is a good one. If flu is broken out for two weeks, eh, you're not probably going to stop it at that point, right? Um, and then the third thing that's super interesting is that um, uh, it's been thought for quite some time that the set of human pathogens is relatively known and relatively stable. Um, but once gene sequencing costs went down, and you can take a sample of something, you can put it in a gene sequencer and say, what viruses do you see? What people learned is that there's just a huge substrate of unknown pathogens. I mean, if, if you do this and then you send it up to these gene databases, you will just find a bunch of, you will just discover viruses. Um, 
And then, yeah, so, so we didn't actually know that before. Now we do, and we, in fact, we know that, that many of these infectious, uh, emerging infectious disease events are caused by pathogens we didn't even know existed. SARS and MERS are, are, are examples. Um, so, so the question is, how do you surveil something that is evolving in animals you may not have known existed before, <laughs> within a time frame of two weeks, before the, where you have some chances to stop them? And um, really, we, we sort of, thought about this data and, and came to the conclusion what you really want to know is what's going on in animals in the environment to give some chance of catching these events before they impact humans. Um, so in terms of cyber physical systems, what this really put us on the path towards was this really ambitious, pretty massive, self-adapting cyber physical system that's going to go from a funny device like this that you put in an environment all the way up to some really interesting, you know, big data analytics in the cloud really has to close that whole loop. Um, so that's what Project Premonition is about, and it all begins with the idea of turning, well, we turn everything into a device or a service in computer science. So it begins with the idea of turning a mosquito into a device. Um, because if in the end we want to know what's going on in the environment, how would you do this as a biologist? You would go out, you would find an animal, you would take a blood sample. Um, in studies, let's say, to understand the evolution of SIV to HIV in chimpanzees, that's what people did. To look for Ebola, people go out and they you know, sample blood from fruit bats, or they, they think it might be in fruit bats, or they take uh, you know, um, bat droppings and they take them back to the lab. These are the kind of activities you do, biologists do, when they zoom in on a particular animal they want to study. Um, now, we want to do this for a bunch of different animals, and it turns out mosquito is kind of the perfect device to do that because it makes its living tracking animals, sneaking in and collecting a blood sample. Um, on average, a mosquito collects about 2.5 microliters of blood. You can hire them for free. Um, they work on every continent but Antarctica, as far as, far as we know. Um, if you think of them like a drone, they're actually, we will not outbuild them anytime soon. Their olfactory systems are, are incredibly advanced. So. Um, you know, if, if, I had, if there are mosquitoes in this room and this thing was puffing out a little bit of CO2, they will go right towards it. Um, uh, they don't just bite humans, they bite just about everything. I've just uh, given you a few examples here of what they bite. Um, so, you know, swine flu evolved in pigs. We believe uh, MERS evolved in dromedary camels. Um, hantavirus lives in rodents. Um, and they feed on all of these things, even reptiles and amphibians. Um, uh, there are about 3,600 known species. Um, if you take a mosquito, you squish it, and you put it into a gene sequencer, you will see all kinds of weird things. This has been validated on a small scale. Um, and then the third thing that's really great about them is that, in principle, we actually do know how to catch them, unlike a dromedary camel or a fruit bat, which might need a different kind of technology for each, each monitoring, you know, each animal you want to monitor. Uh, the reason we know how to catch them is because they've been a primary disease vector for so long, right? That, malaria, dengue, people have always worried about mosquitoes. And it turns out the basic technology isn't that, you know, isn't that sophisticated. Essentially what you need is a net. This is called a CDC light trap, by the way. It was invented in, by the CDC in the 1960s. Um, you need a net, a light bulb, and then on top of this, uh, this device here is a little fan, a little impeller that turns and creates a suction. Um, you hook it up to a car battery and you drape over this device, this igloo full of dry ice. Dry ice sublimates, generates the CO2 plume, and that will draw most blood feeding insects towards it. They get sucked into this little net, and you come back the next day and you have uh, a net full of bugs. Now, in terms of, um, uh, in terms of this, a device like this being the tip of the spear for monitoring pathogens in mosquitoes, this is a current device. This is what most public health organizations will use today, or slightly different, slightly, you know, there are modifications of this design, but, but this is the basic design. Um, uh, and I'll show you some of the problems with that. Um, so we know how to do it. The main problem is that it's low throughput. And if you want to use mosquitoes as a device, you have to get a lot of them, um, and you have to process them quickly in a high throughput way. Um, so, so the major innovations of, of premonition are to first try to build a robotic version of this trap, which can automate a lot of what a biologist has to do so that you collect very quickly from the environment samples that, are, that, that you can use. Um, that was an early uh, design sketch. This is the thing that's actually will sit out in the tropical environment. Uh, I'll tell you more about it. Um, uh, even if you do that, if you, if you build a better way to catch a mosquito, what I'll show you is that there's a second bottleneck, which is just getting samples in and out of the environment. You will see this bottleneck in both urban and rural environments. Um, 
And this is where we've looked at using autonomous systems or semi-autonomous systems like drones to try to locate where mosquitoes are and deploy devices into the environment. Um, uh, once you get samples back, you have that third problem. How do you identify uh, a pathogen you might not even uh, know exists yet? Um, and here is sort of the, the third trend that, that I think makes this project feasible, which is the exponential decrease in cost of gene sequencing. It lets you take biology and turn it into data. Now it becomes a computational problem to sort out what is in that sample, uh, as opposed to a lab test, right? a, a, a chemistry-based lab test. Um, so, so that's sort of the whole scope of the system. Um, you know, in the end, we envision mosquitoes going out, biting a bunch of animals. Um, in a high throughput way, we collect a bunch of mosquitoes. In a high throughput way, we gene sequence them um, and then get a bunch of data, genetic data, about potential pathogens in space and time. So um, this is a simulation. This doesn't exist now. But you know, if we could pull it all off, the idea would be that um, you're just always monitoring the environment. Um, if you make this low cost enough, perhaps it, you, you amortize the cost so that this is feasible, right? As opposed to reacting for $3 billion for Ebola and $2 billion for Zika. Um, you can just always monitor the environment. Um, when you do that, you will see genes coming from mosquitoes. You will see genes of the mosquito. You will see genes that indicate potential hosts, the things they're biting. And then you will see genes of potential pathogens. And if you have this data sort of coming in all the time, what you want to be able to do is fuse it and uncover some interesting epidemiology. Like um, in this simulation, something is suddenly moving um, that you didn't expect to be there. Um, so that's, that, that's the vision. Um, then we had to ask, is this science fiction? Um, this used to be the title of this slide, but I tried to make it a little bit uh, <laughs> about requirements. But we had to ask, you know, is this all science fiction? Often I, I get the feedback, um, this sounds very Jurassic Park, um, right? So, so we have to make sure this isn't just, just Jurassic Park. And, and the way we did that was to build a team which, you know, um, I think complements what happens at Microsoft Research, where we have expertise in uh, formal methods and programming languages um, uh, in machine learning and vision with people who really know what a mosquito does, um, like Doug Norris from Johns Hopkins, who, who works in malaria research and actually goes out and catches these things all the time. But we, worked with, uh, we brought in biologists who, uh, from entomology, from virology, who really go out and they do these things. Um, and then we found a place where we could go and try to collect a bunch of data manually, and that place was, uh, was Grenada. Um, we picked Grenada because um, uh, it's a fairly small, uh, small area. It's about 130 square miles. Represents a bunch of different ecosystems from urban, uh, jungle, cloud forest, uh, peri-urban. Uh, has a medical school, one of the few islands in, in the Caribbean with, the, with its own medical school. Um, and we asked them, can we come to your island and try to sample mosquitoes across it at a rate we would want an autonomous system to do? Um, while flying drones around it to see could a drone potentially figure out where mosquitoes are? And then can we take those back and gene sequence them to see could we find anything in a mosquito? Um, and it was really incredible. They said yes to everything. Um, and they really were excited to see, you know, to help um, evaluate whether a system like this would be possible. Um, so so the, the university there at St. George's University worked with us to pick 50 sites across the island. Um, that's, that averages to roughly a site every five square miles. Um, and uh, this is what they picked. Um, these little red flags are GPS marked locations where we actually went over a five day period. Um, the difference between the two is that we could only visit 30 sites when we picked 50. It gives you a, an idea of the, the throughput, the low throughput of doing this manually, even in a place with very good infrastructure. Um, I also want to point out that this is N, uh, NVDI, uh, NVDI data of Grenada. It says Grenada is green. Um, NVDI gives you some sense of what the vegetation is like in an area. It's been used to predict at a coarse grain level where things like mosquitoes are. And so what a satellite will tell you about Grenada is that it has mosquitoes. Uh, what we'll see is that that's very coarse. <laughs> it really matters where you go, and that's what an entomologist, a trained entomologist knows. So just to give you a sense of then what we did in Grenada, we went there to collect this data. Uh, for 14 hours a day, you hike out to places. Um, uh, you, well, first you fly in about 500 pounds of dry ice. Um, then you hike out to these places, and you hang traps. Um, like I said, the island really opened their doors to us, so we were able to hang traps just about everywhere, in people's uh, laundry rooms, uh, on tourist beaches, in the jungle. 
uh, it allowed us to sample many different ecosystems. Every place that we would hang one of these classic CDC light traps, uh, we would fly, at this time, manually a drone. And the purpose of this drone flight was to gather uh, visual data around specifically where this trap was placed. Because what we know from entomologists' expertise is that if you just put one of these things arbitrarily in the environment, you may catch no mosquito. Um, they actually prefer certain places. They don't necessarily fly that far. So it really matters where you go. Um, again, at this point, this was a manual flight. And uh, uh, nonetheless, we tried to sort of control this uh, flight plan so that it would go up about 50 feet, you know, gather uh, uh, about 100 feet, 100 feet, go up another 50 feet and do kind of the same thing. So we get this column of, uh, of image data around where we would place this device. Um, now, to show you the first bottleneck I mentioned with the trap, we would then go back the next day and pick up this trap, and that's what comes out of it. It's this bag of bugs. Um, you take this bag of bugs, and under a dissecting microscope, you sort out the, uh, the mosquitoes. Um, so that's the data you get, and that's actually the interesting data. Uh, and just to put this into perspective, this is what every public health organization has to do today. So when we talk about dengue, when we talk about Zika, there is a person in a lab whose job is to take bugs and pull the mosquitoes out. Um, and to speciate them, which is non-trivial. It's actually pretty difficult to tell one species apart from the other. Um, and so that has, th that has um, you know, that, that's a low throughput step. Um, from here, we took, it, you know, took advantage of this partnership with, with the medical school in Grenada. Um, brought a, a great set of folks down from University of Pittsburgh to design the protocol to extract the DNA and RNA from these mosquitoes. Um, that's just a cool video of being in a lab, but essentially what they're doing is they're mushing up a mosquito, putting it in a centrifuge, adding some chemicals, and then you get out mosquito juice. You get out two kinds of mosquito juice. One is the DNA, one is the RNA, and then you put this into a gene sequencer and it turns into data. Um, what a, uh, a standard sort of, as I'll use standard in quotes, what, what um, sort of existing metagenomic pipelines will tell you. Metagenomics means, by the way, that um, the, the DNA and RNA you have is a mixture from a bunch of different species, um, as opposed to if you send your, uh, your uh, DNA sample to 23andMe, right, they're assuming it comes from humans, uh, and they're sort of tailoring the analysis to human. Metagenomics, it could be anything, right? Maybe not anything, but a lot of things. And part of it is sort of teasing apart that mixture. Um, so if, if you use an existing metagenomic pipeline, you'll get a graph like this. So there's sort of 80 to 60 to 80 percent of things we are recognized to some degree when you match them against known reference genomes. And then you'll get some buckets where you can say these are probably bacteria, these are probably viruses. And then you'll get you know, some 18 to 20 percent of data where it doesn't match anything in any database in any significant way. Um, and so, so these are probably novel viruses, novel microorganisms. Um, OK, so, so that experiment really validated the bottlenecks that we believed were there. Um, but it also showed that you know, the data we can get back is interesting. We can see fine-grained features in the, from drone data. We can start to pull out what is in a mosquito. Um, and from that point, we really started digging into the technologies more and saying, uh, OK, how do, we, how do we really build it now? Um, so let me start with the, with the trapping device. Um, the point of the trap is to uh, eliminate that sorting step that you saw, where you need a trained entomologist to dump out these bugs and pick them apart. Um, we know from uh, both from high throughput biology and robotics that uniform things are useful because you can process them robotically. Um, uh, but the hard problem with this trap is that it needs to upfront distinguish between something you want to catch and something you don't want to catch. Um, it needs to do that in a jungle, potentially, without additional power sources that runs for 12 to 14 hours. And it can't cost $10,000 because these traps walk away, right? You put them, if you put them in a jungle or you put them in an urban environment, they might not be there the next day. Um, so, so it's a threat to throughput if you can't get that technology in a form factor, which is, you know, uh, scalable enough and inexpensive enough, whilst at the same time giving you the, that kind of intelligence. Um, so, so the design that we came up with used uh, work done at UC Riverside um, to, uh, uh, in real time, classify insect species by basically having them fly through an infrared light. They can't see the infrared light. Um, and when they fly through, they cast a shadow uh, with their wings. And, and the way they cast that shadow turns out to be a fairly identifiable fingerprint is what is what researchers have believed from laboratory studies. And so we sort of took that as a starting point. That's been validated enough that it would, it would provide a reasonable design for being able to, in real time, collect what you want. Um, we put that into a honeycomb-like structure. Uh, that was the sketch. This is the real thing. Um, 
And now this, this, this device in real time can uh, decide if it wants to catch something. If it does, it will close one of these little doors and a sample will be collected inside. And the idea is you have at most one sample per cell. Um, at the moment of collection, it's going to capture a bunch of data about that insect, uh, the time it arrived along with what the environment was like, humidity, ambient light, all of this sort of stuff um, that really has never been captured before about these insects. Um, so that was my lab for the beginning of this project. That's 300 Anopheles uh, Stevens eye mosquitoes, which are the, uh, the mosquitoes that carry malaria in India. Um, my coworkers who normally find software bugs, some of them we're very surprised. Why is my <laughs> office full of mosquitoes? But this is how we started. We get mosquitoes. We started prototyping these sensors. They start flying around. And we start to figure out you know, what sensors can actually hear the wing beat through this infrared light. What kind of compute do we need to detect, but at the same time, keep the cost down? Um, and then maybe six months later, we have our first, uh, our first prototype that we, uh, we start testing on, on, on mosquitoes. Um, uh, let me just mention the, uh, some, some cool things about this device since I it kind of zoomed in here. Um, so we have 64 of these cells. We pick 64 because a good trapping day, what the entomologists tell me, a good trapping day, like fishing, you come back, you have on the order of 60 mosquitoes in a trap. And that's sort of what we saw in, in, in Grenada. That was a good day. Um, um, so we pick six, we rounded to the nearest power of two because we're computer scientists. Um, but we, we, we face some really interesting questions, like I said, about keeping the cost down and making it lightweight, because in the end, we would like to be able to put it on something like a drone. Um, and so one question was, how do you get 64 actuators that can close 64 doors without 64 motors or 64 solenoids that are kind of expensive and power hungry? Um, and so it's actually uh, powering these doors that allows them to, to, to latch is this, um, this uh, flexanol wire. It's a kind of wire that when you put a current through it, it will contract. It's actually the same thing that's in our Surface Book Pros. This isn't the same wire, but it's the same technology. Um, and that replaces these 64 actuators with something that's very inexpensive, very lightweight, uh, and pretty power efficient. Um, uh, uh, let me just say one more thing here. Uh, the tube you see connected there is going to a tank of CO2. Uh, the device in the center is hollow, and that's designed to support its own enclosed lure dispersion, because that's how you draw in these mosquitoes, is, is with some kind of lure. Um, that's a picture of it at night, just because it looks really cool. But uh, black light is, is, is commonly added to these devices to attract uh, insects at night. Um, now, um, once we built that device, we really had to test them. And this was a really interesting process, because uh, biology decides whether you're, you're getting it right or not. Um, and the way we test them is that you release a bunch of mosquitoes into a room with one of these devices uh, sitting in it. Initially, that we did that at MSR, but then with our partners at UC Riverside, who really know what they're doing, they, um, you know, they did that in a more controlled way. So I don't know if you can see on the screen here, but um, you can kind of see these little mosquitoes dancing around the devices with the infrared camera. So you can actually see the infrared LEDs. And you see these little cells closing, uh, closing and trapping them. And those are tested on the mosquito called Aedes aegypti. It's the primary vector for things like dengue and Zika. Um, uh, but we've also tested it on, on other mosquitoes. Um, so at this point, we sort of know from all the laboratory tests that the device can effectively catch mosquitoes, which we didn't know when we started this whole process. Um, the data you get out looks like this. When something flies into one of these cells, you get this time domain signal, um, uh, uh, which you then do uh, a spectral analysis on. Um, uh, and these are the time domain signals for three important types of mosquitoes. This one is called Culex quinquefasciitis, Anopheles stevensi, and Aedes aegypti. And um, I know the font is pretty small here, but what you're seeing is the a histogram of the primary frequency you get when you do this spectral analysis. And so what you see is that um, each of these three, three important species, they're, they're pretty distinguishable. So basically, any machine learning algorithm will be able to tell these things apart. Um, this is as far as we can get right now, I think, in a laboratory setting. The next thing to do is to put this into an environment where who knows what can fly into it will fly into it. And that will provide a really interesting training set to try to teach the system in some, right, some environment to do the right thing. Uh, it, will, it will be very exciting. Um, the other thing that the device can do, which no existing trap can do today, is to reveal the behavior of these insects. Um, so this is just the arrival time of mosquitoes in a greenhouse at UC Riverside uh, over a night. These are nighttime feeding mosquitoes. Um, 
And because this trap is counting everything that happens at the exact moment, you can actually see when these mosquitoes are encountering this trap and when they aren't. So in one night, you see the circadian rhythm of an important mosquito. In this case, it was Culex quinquefasciitis. Um, and that circadian rhythm is useful because it tells you the time of the day that this thing will bite you, right? <laughs> and before, how did you uncover a circadian rhythm? Well, you tried to raise a colony in an insectary, and I think UCSD should have an insectary uh, with mosquito that they, where they raise these mosquitoes in. It's a lot of work. Um, it's really fun to visit an insectary, by the way, to see the kind of work they do. Um, but this is the kind of data you get when you really take this fundamental problem of catching mosquitoes and you put sort of the embedded systems into it, the machine learning into it, that we know helps in so many different domains. So it was really exciting to see that happen. Um, yeah, so, so at this point, we're basically ready to start putting this into a real environment. Um, so after this talk uh, tomorrow, I will fly to a real environment where we will put this. Hopefully it doesn't get eaten by alligators. Um, OK, so now I'll step up a level from the trap. That's where we started bringing technology in to try to solve this first bottleneck. Um, and then the second one is locating mosquitoes and deploying, uh, deploying and collecting devices from the environment. Um, and really what we learned is that this is a major bottleneck, not just in our experiment in Grenada, but if you take today with the Zika situation, um, the mosquitoes that people are trying to watch out for are urban mosquitoes. They don't fly very far, and they will grow in a bottle cap full of water. Um, so how today do public health organizations figure out where they need to spray for mosquitoes? They actually have to go around and they have to look, and they have to do that basically every day. Um, so this is a place where autonomous systems seem like they can really offer a benefit if we can get them to be safe and robust and collect the right kind of data. Um, uh, so from, from, you know, from the Microsoft point of view, from the MSR point of view, um, we sort of view this Cambrian explosion of drones as something that's here. And the question we tried to ask is, how do we take these pretty capable systems and give them the, 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 the solid foundations that you trust them to go out and, they, and do something interesting? Um, and roughly the stack of technologies that we're building up goes all the way from the operating system level, where a lot of work at, at MSR has been done on, on operating systems, and particularly making them secure, resilient to hacks. Um, on top of that, running the kind of sensing and control so the, the uh, drone can understand its environment and make you know, uh, short-term decisions about how to navigate it. And then finally, high-level planning, which allows the drone to do something like you know, avoid obstacles and pick a place to go over here. Um, so obviously, there's tons of interesting technologies in, in the stack. Um, I would just kind of flash a few of them uh, uh, up, and then, and then you know, feel, feel free to ask questions. Um, in terms of secure operating systems, the place that we sort of started from was uh, work done to make a secure desktop operating system. A lot of the work at MSR on OSs have, has come from that perspective, right? How do we make a desktop operating system which is secure? Um, and uh, uh, one of the, the research operating systems called Verve is um, interesting in that it, it is, has mechanically verified subcomponents like garbage collector, thread, interrupt, handlers, device interfaces, um, which have been mechanically verified, um, but also provides uh, memory safety. So it's a very interesting place to start from because it has a lot of, it eliminates a lot of things that can go wrong up front. Um, the challenge, though, with putting it on something like a drone is that you have to move it from the desktop view to the real-time world where it really matters when things happen and a garbage collector can't just start up arbitrarily and start doing stuff. That's how you crash a drone. That's one way you crash a drone. <laughs> um, but it's an interesting starting point because at the same time it has, you know, probably on the order of seven or eight person years of mechanical proofs done. So it's a very interesting starting point. Um, in terms of robust sensing, um, this is also very interesting, especially as you start to untether drones and really imagine them going out and, and making decisions on their own. What always will happen is that sensors will fail um, or drones will go in a place that they've never experienced before. Uh, this really hit me when we were in Grenada and we would fly these drones with a pilot. Uh, I mean, for instance, we flew them uh, near a school and you have all of the kids rushing out with their teachers to see the cool drone. I would, I would want to rush out and see it too. But it really just strikes you very concretely that that drone has to work correctly because if it doesn't, <laughs> you have you know uh, 50 school children and their teachers standing right underneath of it. Um, and so, so sensing is really interesting because that's the eyes and the ears of this of the system. Um, and so, what we have started to look at is how do we have the system reflect on what it doesn't know? Um, 
Um, and, and the point of view that, that we have been looking at is, is sort of these Bayesian classifiers where at least what they can give you is kind of goodness of classification in the terms of an interval. I know I'm, I'm not just going to give you a point estimate that I'm a, a meter from the wall, but I will give you a range that reflects certainty. Um, and that can allow the control system to respond in different ways, right? If, if you're very uncertain about what you know, you can be more conservative in how you respond. Um, in terms of, of correct control, this is my main formal method slide, um, and I'm happy to talk more about it. Uh, even when you do all of this, what happens is you look inside the actual implementation of these systems, and it's just, it's just very complicated software. And it's software that's very hard to verify in the classical way, where you write pre and post conditions on methods, or you do you know, bounded model checking, because the, the requirements of the software are that the drone doesn't crash into a wall. And you can't write that specification in the soft, in, in, in the software world itself, right? It's a specification that involves the physics. This is the, in little teeny font there, that's the, uh, uh, the physical model of a drone, of a quadrotor drone. Um, and it involves that tight uh, closed loop with the, with the software. And so, so one basic question is how do you scale up hybrid, uh, hybrid validation, hybrid verification, so that you get uh, sooner rather than later a sense of you know, how can the software go wrong given what a drone actually will do in a physical environment. Um, and then finally, if you, even if you get all that right, you still have to tell the, the drone still has to do something like figure out how exactly, uh, question, a hybrid verification question. No. I'm, oh, okay. <laughs> I'm curious uh, how, I mean, yeah. this is, what the number of parts of this system is really awesome and it's, it's cool to see how you thought all of them through. I'm curious how long it will be before whether the drone is autonomous is actually the limiting function on your success. Mm -hmm. Like if all of the parts of the stack work, yeah. except that you needed to pay somebody in Texas to fly the drone, mm -hmm. how bad off would you be? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I would say we probably, I would say probably nobody really knows the answer to that yet. And it, and it will probably depend on the scenario. Um, if we look at, uh, I mean, if we look at public health organizations, um, they will not have a staff of a thousand people. I'd say that would, if, uh, j just for the people, let's say, going out and sort of, uh, looking for mosquitoes, it won't, it won't be a thousand people. Um, maybe it will be 20 people. So if you have a pilot per drone, you get a sense of scalability. Um, uh, and then that 20 people might be for actually quite a large area. Um, uh, I, mean, it, I totally believe that in a limit, yeah, it yeah. be autonomous. I guess I'm just wondering, how, I mean, how long is it before that becomes your gate? Have, have you pre-optimized a step that's not yet the bottleneck? Right, yeah. So it, 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 um, it could be, for example, if, if drones could fly further, let's say. If they could cover you know, 100 square miles and still get useful data, then maybe you need one in a pilot, uh, sort of a pilot, can command it. Um, I think if you, wanted, if you wanted to do something more complex, like really land something into an environment and take it back out, uh, even a pilot doing that manually is hard. Um, you can imagine you put on your, uh, your VR or your HoloLens. I mean, people are trying to figure out how to do this, right? Do we do it that way so that somebody can control the drone in this complex environment? So, I think you're right that, that it could be there are drone platforms that allow one pilot to scale to larger areas. Um, that can work for certainly surveillance, but I think when you want a drone to really interact with the environment in a more complex way, place something, uh, retrieve something, then even, even the pilot per drone gets tricky because just your situational awareness right now is very limited. Um, maybe there's a better way to do it. Uh, um, I, th I think it's going to be tricky, though. The, the drone probably will need to make, be able to make some autonomous decisions, would, would be sort of my guess. Or yeah. you could end up with a hybrid system where the drone does some things and the pilot does the others. Or, true, you know, true, the yeah. Just keep an eye on 10 of these, and yeah. if the school kid runs in front, then you'd switch on the control. You know, there may be some interesting right. in, options. Yeah, in, in a way, for some of the off-the-shelf drones that will do things like fly a mission and just collect video, they are kind of in that semi-autonomous mode. You have technically the remote control. Um, and you can override its behavior. Um, uh, and yeah, uh, it, so, so that software has to work correctly. 
<laughs> of course. <laughs> Otherwise, you'll be overriding its behavior quite a bit. Um, but yeah, I, I think you're right. We, we, we don't yet know. I think nobody yet knows what happens if you have a million drones flying around. Does that unlock the scale that you need? Did you not need a million drones flying around in the first place? Um, or, I mean, I, you know, do you get the, and I'll let you go on. Yes. Yeah. I, I mean, my own inclination would be to have 100 of these things working before you worry about the scale. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that's absolutely right. So, um, I mean, the way that, that we're approaching it is to, to think systematically about the software stack on a drone. Because I think, scale or not, that's a key issue. Um, uh, and then to go, to start small um, by trialing these technologies in, in, in small places where the results can be really interesting. Um, but I think you're right. To really know how you have to scale, you start small. Um, if the feedback from that is positive, you have a positive feedback cycle that allows the system to grow. We've seen that, for instance, in, uh, in street view technology. Right? It wasn't obvious at first that driving a car around and taking a video of everything was useful. But you do it in one city, and you see how useful it is. And that creates a positive feedback cycle where now a lot of the cities on the planet are mapped. We also see it in satellite imagery. right? Initially, the satellite industry was mainly subsidized by government, by DOD uh, and intelligence, because they were the only customer. Um, and now we see the satellite industry exploding in different ways, because that, uh, they understand now how they need to scale from starting in a place where it's useful and then seeing how, the, how that data can expand in new directions. So I, I think you're absolutely right. That's, that's the way these things go. Um, we will not start out by, I will not start out by asking Microsoft to buy me a million drones. Uh, <laughs> they wouldn't anyway. Um, <laughs> uh, so just to give you a sense of what you can see from one of these drones with, with, with uh, respect to mosquitoes, uh, I don't know why this video, this, the video is actually quite clean, but projectors don't like this video for some reason. Um, this is a drone looking at the most mosquito-y spot we were in in Grenada. Um, uh, what it can see is this mangrove swamp. You can see kind of the stagnant water here. Um, you have a bunch of dilapidated vehicles. So this is actually an auto mechanic. Next to a mangrove swamp, you have a pig farm and a restaurant. So it's a great place for all sorts of mosquitoes. Um, uh, and it represented this spike in the mosquito count there. Um, of course, these other spikes are the mosquito counts for other places we, we went over this island. And so what you see is that there's a lot of variability in where you actually catch where it's a, uh, a useful place to take a sample. Um, and this is what an entomologist knows. If an entomologist is going, a field entomologist, they will know right, where they should look and where they should avoid. Um, if we want to scale this, if we want drones, I mean, even if it's one person who doesn't have to walk around and look in yards for, for you know, containers of water, um, if we're going to scale that, we have to teach the drone, of course, to find these indicators. Um, and that's the sort of data set that, that we started to collect in, in Grenada. Um, basically, you take a video, a drone video, you reconstruct from that uh, either a panorama or a 3D model. In fact, we, we can also reconstruct the camera pose. Um, and now you have a training set to match what you see in the environment with actual mosquito counts. Um, the goal of which is to solve the initial subproblem: how do you even find where these things are hiding? Um, this is something that, that we will be uh, uh, testing more this summer. Um, to really build up these classifiers for some interesting uh, urban mosquitoes. Um, OK, then I'll go into the last component, which is uh, what do you do with all this data that you get back? Um, uh, so the data you get back is super interesting. Um, of course, at every stage, at, at every phase of this, you get back actually super interesting data. From here, I, I showed you some of the data you get. Um, from the drone, you get back very interesting image data of the environment. Um, from the mosquitoes, you get back super interesting data. So from a single trap like this, you would get back about 200 gigabytes of metagenomic data. Um, and now the question is, what is floating around in that? What are the signals in, in, in that data? Um, and you know, roughly, the, the, the hardness of sorting that out, I've, I sort of tried to express it here, um, goes from figuring out what kind of mosquito you have, what it's bitten, to the diversity of microbes and viruses that are in that mosquito. And then when none of that works, you're going to start to ask questions about what are the proteins that these weird, with these weird genes that we've never seen before code for, and are those proteins related to something that we've coded for? This is absolutely a super interesting and major field in, in, in biology. These problems in general are, are, not, are not solved. Um, uh, 
But I will show you what happens if you take this data and you put it through kind of standard metagenomic pipeline. You put, take that 200 gigabytes of data, that's this arc here, and then these little arcs are the entire genomes of known mosquitoes with some cryptic, crypt, cryptic labels written on them. Um, there's a line from our data to a mosquito's genome if an algorithm says you have a snippet of mosquito genome in your data. Um, and so what you see from this kind of standard pipeline is that it's bucketing most of these mosquito uh, snippets to this particular spe species called Culex pipiens, uh, which is what we know was in the sample because we had an entomologist validate that said that, that, that was in the sample. Um, and so already an algorithm can pick this out. We can say the mosquito you have is very likely Culex pipiens. Of course, there's a bunch of noise here. Not too much, but you see there's a bunch of straight lines to malaria, random malaria mosquitoes and you know, yellow fever mosquitoes because the algorithms aren't perfect. Now, you strip away that data and you start to ask a deeper question. What did it bite? What kind of animal did it bite? Um, same thing, that's our 200 gigabytes of data and then this is the genomes of a bunch of animals. Here's human, here's a mouse, uh, here's a dog. And you see the data gets a bit fuzzier, right? Th this algorithm says, most likely this mosquito has bitten a human, and that's a partial reconstruction of its genome. Um, but it's noisy. Do you really trust it? Eh. Is it just that a lot of gene sequences are human genomes, and so there's a bias in our existing databases? Um, uh, and it turns out that um, the problem today with these kind of analyses is you don't really know the answer to that question. You don't know to what confidence you can really assign um, uh, 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 you know, how confidently can you call human in the sample? Um, and so what it, the, the place where analysis often really starts in these metagenomic pipelines is the pipeline basically filters out maybe uh, most of this 200 gigabytes, it gives you back 100 megabytes, and then a biologist perhaps with expertise in virology or fungi or whatever actually starts to look at these sequences and say, do they make any sense? Um, if we imagine doing this at scale, you can't look at 200 gigabytes of data per <laughs> per device. You really have to start to figure out how do we increase throughput and build confidence about the signals. Um, and so some really, <clears throat> some, some really interesting researchers at, at, uh, at MSR who have worked with Berkeley on both improving throughput of these algorithms and, uh, uh, and on trying to give confidence measures to what they, uh, what they tell you, um, apply two things. One is Bayesian mixture models to try to ask what is the recipe of genes mixed in the soup from sort of a a statistically well-founded point of view, right, Bayesian mixture models, um, and then combining that with something called SNAP. SNAP is a, uh, a kind of pattern matcher that matches these little snippets of these little strings against these known uh, genomes. Um, these data sets are so huge that you have to do a lot of work to make this efficient. SNAP is probably one of the fastest that's been used in a in, in number of metagenomics tools, but it's co-developed with uh, Berkeley and MSR. Um, and so we started to apply this system to mosquito metagenomes and we go from that kind of fuzzy chart I showed you to something like this. This is an analysis of the kind of host in, uh, in the mosquitoes in Grenada. Um, we're just showing everything in this Bayesian mixture model, even things that we would throw away because there's probability is so small. But one thing I'll point out here is that this analysis switches from human to bird on the same data. So it's a pretty major switch when you really start to say, um, when you really start to uh, impose sort of a statistically rigorous, a different kind of formal methods to the problem. Um, and in this case, birds actually biologically makes a lot of sense for this kind of mosquito that we caught. Um, uh, I know now, now the text gets very small. Um, if you now strip away the host, um, I mean, so we can ask the easy, the easy thing, what kind of mosquito did it say is there? Everything will get that right because you get so much mosquito material when you do this gene sequencing. Just everything basically gets that right. Um, if you strip all that away and you now ask about viruses, um, that's where it gets really interesting. This pipeline uh, is accurately pulling out the viruses, um, which are which are flaviviruses. Flaviviruses are the same thing as dang, the same family that includes things like dengue and Zika. Um, uh, and we know that in this sample we have flaviviruses because a biologist actually looked at the gene sequence, you know, the sequence data to 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 validate that. Um, and we even know that some of them are unknown. Um, some of them, if you match them against a database, they haven't been seen before. Um, and so what this pipeline can do now is to start to add those up and say, even though this flavivirus is unknown, it's close enough to flavivirus that there's evidence to put it in that family. And now you kind of get a score that aggregates together these unknowns and still pulls up an interesting signal. Um, 
what exactly does that interesting signal look like? This is um, uh, uh, one of the novel viruses we discovered in Grenada. It's a flavivirus found in the Culex mosquito. Um, and it was reconstructed by using metagenomic pipelines plus a virologist who really understands the architecture of viruses to reconstruct the, the full genome. Um, and uh, that's the kind of thing that that pipeline can pull out. Right now you still need a virologist to validate that and say this is really a novel virus to do that reconstruction. Um, but this is a really interesting, I think, place to sort of leave to, to finish the story. Uh, when you do these experiments today, if you take a mosquito and you do this, you'll get a data point like this. Um, that data point is potentially interesting because it's a family of viruses that are dangerous, potentially dangerous, carried in a mosquito that's very common. But in many cases, you will see this data point once. You discover this novel virus in this mosquito in this one place one time. And you won't know if this is common. You won't know how similar it is to something that, 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 you know, that might be evolving in a dog. You won't even know what host it came from. Um, if you can imagine scaling this, pulling these signals up in a high throughput way where you have confidence about what these signals are, then the idea is that you start to you know, stitch these examples together. You get more data points to try to triangulate what this funny thing is. So we're going back to the original vision that with enough samples, with enough data, you can uncover an epidemiology you didn't understand before. Um, so, so let me just, um, uh, I'll try to save time for questions. Let me just say how, how far off is this. Um, I'm just going to randomly say five years. And the reason I will randomly say five years is because I think what's super exciting about, uh, about this problem is just the technology trends are so clear. I mean, even if my code is terrible and I built totally the wrong <laughs> mosquito trap. The technology trends are super clear. First, um, I mean Moore's law, I always have to say Moore's law, but more importantly, um, if you look at a, play, a field like entomology, that's the tip of the spear for doing these kinds of analyses, their technology has not taken advantage of where computing is today. We can just solve it. Um, uh, it's totally solvable. Um, and it will, get, it will give you data in one day that you could not get before. Um, uh, the, I think the explosion of commodity drones and robotic platforms is not going to go anywhere. We already know that these platforms are highly capable. Um, and so the, really the, the missing thing is making sure that they do what they're supposed to do safely, that society accepts them operating in the, in the environment. Um, but it's not going to go anywhere. And then finally, I mean, gene sequencing is pretty incredible that its cost is decreasing faster than Moore's law, um, which means that you know, while in the uh, mid-2000s it would have cost $10 million to sequence my genome, Today, it costs a few thousand dollars to sequence my genome. That's the rate at which this is going down. So you can basically assume you will be able to take biological data, uh, biological data and turn it into digital data. Um, so I think when you take those three trends and you push them together, it's just very clear. Um, there is a set of trends that show we can do better with, uh, with trying to understand monitoring uh, uh, potential emerging infectious diseases before they happen. Uh, even, if, you know, even if we get it totally wrong, the, the, I, I think the trends are clear. So I will say five, five years. Um, so, um, so thank you for that uh, long rambling story. And uh, I hope I have time for some crazy questions. <laughs>